So you've heard this a lot from me already. Each generation of artists tends to rebel against the preceding generation. In this second to last unit of our AP Art History course, the process speeds up and artistic revolutions come at us fast and furious. In part, I'm sure this reflects the quickening pace of technological change and the social and emotional impact of total war. Photography plays a role too. Even the most perfect illusionist painting is going to capture less optical reality than a camera, which invites artists to define reality in terms of their inner emotions, or a hidden subconscious, or an oppressive economic superstructure, or maybe they even deny that we can grasp reality at all. So why did the post-impressionists rebel against impressionism? You read about this in your homework. Basically, these artists became impatient with the very element of Impressionist art that the Impressionists themselves most avidly embraced. The transience, the focus on a fleeting moment in time and space. Post-Impressionists struggled to capture what they saw as more essential underlying realities in our world, but they did this in very different ways. To wrap our heads around different ways to capture reality, let's look at two seascapes. Bottom left is a painting by Winslow Homer, a somewhat romantic realist. Upper right is the painting by Monet that gave Impressionism its name. Clearly, the Monet moves closer to abstraction, but what do these paintings have in common? Again, they each intend to capture a particular fleeting moment. They also share a somewhat identifiable perspective, in other words, we can more or less figure out where we, the viewer, stand or swim in relation to the scene. Both artists use color vividly, but still realistically. Remember that the Impressionists were trying to show us how our eyes actually capture color and convey that information to the brain. And here we have two depictions of a sower, one by realist Millet and the other by post-Impressionist Van Gogh who modeled his painting after Millet's. Millet is capturing the hard work, but also the poetry of labor. Van Gogh, however, is seeking a deeper symbolic meaning. As he explained, and these are his own words, the sower and the wheat sheaf stand for eternity, and the reaper and his scythe for irrevocable death. Note, too, that the wheat fields are suddenly blue, and that the sunset comes alive with radiating lines. Color and line are taking on new roles and responsibilities in Van Gogh's painting. The content, moreover, reflects a new reliance on symbolism, including the symbolic or expressionist use of color. So here are works by the post-impressionist Gang of Four. From the upper left, moving clockwise, Seurat, Van Gogh, Cezanne, and Gauguin. They seem like a rather odd cast of characters. I would not describe these paintings or the painter's techniques as especially similar. In fact, the art critic who first lumped these four together is an, in an ism tried to find a more descriptive term. In the end, the only element he knew they had in common was that they had been heavily influenced by the Impressionists but wanted to take their art a step further. So he labeled them post-Impressionists. Actually, I think there's another pretty clear unifying element, which is a fascination with the expressive power of color. We will encounter the term expressive or expressionism a lot in these last two units. The Gardner's textbook reading defined expressionism as, quote, the result of the artist's unique inner or personal vision that often has an emotional dimension. Expressionism contrasts with art focused on visually describing the empirical world, Representation, representational art. It's art seen, if you will, with an inner eye, and it's often characterized by manipulation of color to evoke an emotional response. We're going to be looking a lot at color in this unit, so I thought now might be a good time to review the concepts of hue, value, and saturation. Here's what we usually, hue is what we usually think of as color, red, blue, yellow, green, etc. Value is defined as the relative lightness or darkness of a color. It is an important tool for artists because they can use value to define form and to create spatial illusions. If the values are close, that is light against light, dark against dark, the shapes will seem to flatten out and appear to be closely connected in space. These shapes, in other words, will not stand out from the others. If values contrast light against dark, Shapes will appear to separate in space, and some will stand out from the others. 
Gardeners define saturation as the brightness or dullness of a hue. But I think a better definition is that saturation refers to the dominance of hue or purity in the color. A very bright red is pure hue. <clears throat> As the saturation is reduced, the image becomes grayer, and eventually you have what your printer prompt will call grayscale. The post-impressionists weren't just playing with color, however. They were also trying to solve what they saw as two problems with, impression, with Impressionism. The first perceived problem was that Impressionist effort to capture a brief fleeting moment meant that Impressionist paintings lost some of the ability to capture the abiding reality of a three-dimensional world. Other color effects are come by manipulating the contrast between colors. So look first at the three panels on top. The very same colors used, are used in each panel, yet depending on the choice of dominant color, the feeling of the composition and even the appearance of each color is altered. So the bottom panel illustrates the principle of simultaneous contrast. The same colors seem to alter when they appear against different backgrounds. This phenomenon was first explained in the 19th century by the color theoretician Michel Chevreul. You read about him in your homework. He discovered that changes in the hue, value, and saturation and area of a background color will actually change how our eye perceives the selected colors. The bands in the left and right hand panels are actually the same hue and value, but the different background color affects how we see these colors. We will see Cezanne in particular play with these concepts in Mount St. Victoire. To try to see what bothered the post-impressionists, let's look back at a painting from my last lecture, Monet's Rouen Cathedral. In capturing the momentary appearance of this building in different light, Monet sacrifices some of what Renaissance and Baroque painters had worked so hard to capture, the illusion of form in space. I've snipped and blown up a square out of Monet's cathedral renditions. See how you get when you get up close, the shape essentially disappears into brushstrokes. The post-impressionists viewed this as a loss. Indeed, it was this realization that prompted the quote from Renoir that he realized he no longer knew how to paint or draw. Partly in response, post-impressionist painters reintroduced line as a significant design element. Note that we already saw line reassert itself in the work of Cassatt and Degas. The other problem that some post-impressionists had with impressionist painters was that they chose insignificant content. Now, I love this painting, but Renoir isn't trying to convey a deep message here. The post-impressionists, and even more artists from some of the later schools of art will examine, felt the paintings needed to address eternal concepts. We've already seen how Van Gogh imbued his sower with a deeper symbolic and indeed religious importance. Okay, enough long-winded intro. Let's turn now to a closer look at our four postmodern impressionist painters. Post-impressionist painters, I didn't mean postmodern, sorry. George Seurat and Pointillism used to show up on the AP exam all the time. He's fallen off the list, but his work heavily influenced the other three post-impressionists who do remain on the list, Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Cezanne. Seurat painted with tiny dots of colors that, seen from a little distance, blend and produce light-filled canvases, like the Impressionists, but with a much stronger line. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear from an even more noted art historian. Bugs Bunny. He's actually going to run in and out of a bunch of our required works for this unit, so I thought you'd enjoy the clip. Seurat's highly scientific color juxtapositions produced works that seemed a little frozen. No one could accuse our next post-impressionist, Vincent van Gogh, of painting frozen scenes. Wheatfield with Crows may have been his last painting. Just a few weeks later, he would be dead of a probably self-inflicted gunshot wound to the abdomen. This painting was in the gardener's reading. Now that you know something about post-impressionist concerns, what post-impressionist elements do you see here? Like Seurat, Van Gogh uses complementary colors to create an impact, but his colors are bold, jarring, disturbing. And like Seurat, he seeks to restore the importance of line, but Van Gogh's lines pulse with energy and movement. Instead of tiny dots, he applies paint in thick swaths with raised brushstrokes that themselves create a kind of line. And finally, the perspective is oddly distorted. We, the viewers, are not seeing this scene from a single vantage point. 
By contrast, Van Gogh explained that he deliberately chose the colors in this painting of the bedroom in his retreat at Arles to convey serenity and peaceful retreat. Here again, we are really viewing from multiple perspectives. There is no single vanishing point. This is probably Van Gogh's most famous work, and you looked at it over the summer. Like many of his greatest paintings, it was produced as Van Gogh struggled with depression and fits of delusion. He painted Starry Night in an asylum where he had committed himself. Many of you made very interesting comments about this work in our summer discussions. After three quarters of APR history, do you see it any differently now? You remember, I hope, the association of cypress trees with death and also the parallel steeple that also reaches into that hyperactive sky. Van Gogh spent several years as a Christian evangelist, and his paintings often convey a religious meaning. Van Gogh was a friend and colleague of our next post-impressionist, Paul Gauguin. In fact, the two men spent two months together painting at Van Gogh's retreat in Arles. The visit ended badly. According to Gauguin's account, on the evening of December 23, 1888, Van Gogh confronted him with a razor, demanding to know if he intended to leave Arles. Gauguin confirmed that yes, he was leaving. He found Van Gogh's behavior disturbing and erratic. Van Gogh turned and fled, and worried by his companion's irrational behavior, Gauguin spent the night in a hotel. The following morning, when Gauguin returned to the Yellow House, he was shocked to find it splattered with blood. Taken into custody by the police for interrogation, he discovered that Van Gogh had returned home after their confrontation and mutilated his left ear. Bleeding profusely, Van Gogh went first to a brothel and then was taken to a hospital. Gauguin returned to Paris and Van Gogh never saw him again. Here is Van Gogh's painting of the aftermath of that incident. But back to Gauguin. Like other post-impressionists, Gauguin sought to convey a deeper meaning in his paintings. Wish I had more time for this painting. If you're interested, there's a good Khan Academy podcast on it. But note the expressive as opposed to realistic use of color. The grass in Brittany, where Gauguin painted this work, is not scarlet. Nor does the painting capture, as impressionists try to, a fleeting moment in real space and time. In a letter to Van Gogh, Gauguin explicitly explained, for me, the landscape and the fight only exist in the imagination of the people praying after the sermon. Again, more expression of an inner life. Unlike Van Gogh, however, and more like the Impressionist, Gauguin deliberately flattened and twisted his pictorial space. Note, by the way, how the juxtaposition of strong color values helps produce this effect. Here, Gauguin is also reflecting the influence of Japanese woodblock prints. Note the similarity between Jacob and the Angel and a Hakusai print of sumo wrestlers. Gauguin painted in Brittany to escape what he saw as the corruption of city life, but Brittany did not prove to be far enough away. I just note that Gauguin was also escaping the responsibility of a wife and five children whom he abandoned. In 1887, Gauguin set sail for the Caribbean. When Martinique proved disappointing, he returned to Paris, visited Van Gogh and Arles, and then in 1891, persuaded the French government to sponsor a trip to Tahiti. His job would be to record the people and their customs. In Tahiti, he developed a taste for underage girls, he contributed to the local syphilis outbreak, and he painted what he described as primitive scenes. Riddled with disease and nearing death, Gauguin painted this grim vision of the cycle of life and death. Read from right to left, like the Quran and the Golden Haggadah, this captures cycles of human life. Note Gauguin's heavy use of symbolism, with the various figures representing stages of human life. The baby at the far right signifies newborn life. The figure of questionable sex, whose back is turned to the viewer, is interpreted by some art historians to symbolize the beginning of an individual's realization of gender. The apple-picking male and the girl to his left, who sits eating an apple, reenact the fable of Adam and Eve and the quest for knowledge. The old lady at the far left of the frame sits on the verge of death, unclothed as a parallel, perhaps, to the baby and the painting's far right. Many art historians view Cezanne as the true founder of modern art. Like Seurat, he studied the science of color, and like all the post-impressionists, he worried that impressionist painting lacked form, structure, and serious content. But he also moved toward greater abstraction. Not all the way, notice you can still identify this as mountains and fields and houses. 
He also took even more liberties with space and time. This painting is an extended experiment in color juxtaposition. The small patches of juxtaposed colors with the cool colors, blue and green, receding, and the warm colors, yellow and orange, advancing, gives the painting a sense of spatial depth. That was quite deliberate, but note that the painting does not obey the rules of mathematical linear perspective. The picture plane is quite flat. Cezanne does not try to disguise the essentially two-dimensional nature of painting. He embraces it and he exploits it. Indeed, what really makes Cezanne the founder of modern, even abstract art, is the way he plays with perspective. Since the Renaissance, artists had struggled to create an illusion of space on a two-dimensional canvas, three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional canvas. Cezanne rejects one-point perspective and instead tries to capture the same scene from different viewing positions and even different points in time. Basically, he wants to have it all. He wants to create an illusionistic three-dimensional space, and he wants to expose the two-dimensional reality of all paintings. Some of his techniques are easier to see in this rather similar painting. Note how Cezanne adapts the Impressionist's short, thick brushstrokes, grouping related colors into a kind of block of color. He also reintroduces traditional black shadows and outlines. By the way, Cezanne's brushstrokes evolved initially he used thick impasto style brushstrokes like Monet's. Later, he moved toward much lighter applications of paint. In Saint Mount Saint Victoire, for example, some of the paint is so thin that the underlying canvas shows through. So we need to understand that loose brushstrokes are not always the same as thick, heavy brushstrokes or impasto. Again, this snip gives you a sense of how Cezanne used blocks of color and a stronger line. Basically, Cezanne is trying to get us to look at pictures both two-dimensionally up close and three-dimensionally when we get back up and regain a sense of depth and space. Let's look at this painting again. Note that Cezanne does use some atmospheric perspective to help create depth, yet the patches of color do not get smaller as they move further back. So again, the landscape both provides an illusion of 3D space and a two-dimensional use of color. On to a couple of very strange end-of-century paintings and a sculpture.